Hey there, and welcome to Red Menace, a podcast where we go over theory from revolutionary Marxist perspectives, and we talk about what it means, break it down for you, and help explain how it's relevant for our work today. Uh, in today's episode, we're going to go ahead and look at a shorter text by Marx, the Critique of the Gotha Program, and try to break down what is important about this text. It's not very long, but there's an incredible amount of work done in it in terms of Marx really developing and clarifying some of his views about the state and about organizing, and it's our hope at least that this will be useful for us sort of uh, thinking about the problems that are still faced today that this text really gets at. So if you like what we're doing here, you can check us out on other forms of social media. We are on Twitter at red underscore menace pod, and we are also on uh, Patreon, patreon.com slash the red menace. If you want to support us there, we release monthly extra episodes for people that get into some more thoughts that we have often sort of miscellaneous subjects or sometimes expanding on what we've done in some of the texts that we've read in a given month. So with all that said, uh, I want to go ahead and start this episode by giving us a little bit of historical context for the critique of the Gotha program what it is, where it's coming from, and what we sort of need to know in order to contextualize it within a given historical moment. So the critique of the Gotha program is originally a criticism written by Marx of a party program that was proposed by the Social Democratic Workers' Party of Germany. And the program was drafted in preparation for a party congress where that party was going to try to merge with the General German Workers' Association. So the General German Workers Association uh, was a group founded by and ideologically influenced by Ferdinand LaSalle. And LaSalle is sort of a strange historical figure. Uh, he had been involved in various political organizations, but he began to drift to socialist organizing. And there were some major divergences between Marx and LaSalle's ideas that underlie the exchange found in the Critique of the Gotha program. Uh, LaSalle was a bit eccentric himself. He died fairly young uh, from engaging in a duel. He also had an ongoing correspondence with Otto von Bismarck, just a very strange figure. And some of his ideas really clearly upset Marx, and we're going to see that developed here. So LaSalle was distinctive for a couple things. He proposed the notion of an iron law of wage that states that wages always drop to the lowest possible level. And this sounds like something that you would expect a Marxist to agree with. But in opposition to this, Marx argued that there actually may be a general trend in this direction, but there are also obvious empirical instances where wage moves in the other direction and not just towards bare substance. And he also argued that this idea coming from LaSalle was sort of negatively impacted by other political economists. Uh, specifically Malthus and a sort of fatalism about poverty in Malthus's work, and also through a misinterpretation of Ricardo. We don't need to get into all the political economy to understand this, but this is one point of divergence. Uh, the other point of divergence, which is very important for this text, is that LaSalle also broke from Marx uh, by insisting that the state was not really just like a tool of class rule, which is kind of the traditional Marxist understanding, but by instead arguing that the state had some level of independence from the ruling class and could be used by socialists for progressive ends. And we're really going to see this come to a head in this text. So in this text, Marx kind of is going to break down the Gotha program essentially sentence by sentence, uh, arguing that the goal of unifying with the Lasallians, you know, corrupted the politics of the party and allowed an opportunist line to develop. And despite Marx's concerns about the merger of these two groups, they did eventually merge and adopt a slightly modified version of the program and eventually became the Socialist Workers' Party uh, in Germany, which you may know some things about from a, its very important historical role. So that's some of the background in which this text is taking place. And now I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Brett and let him start us off with sort of wrestling with what's in this text. Okay, so... First and foremost, let's zoom out and highlight the primary theoretical contributions of this text so that we can have a sense of what Marx is trying to accomplish before we dive into the details. So this text, as Allison explained, is a response to the program for pursuing socialism put forward by the Social Democratic Workers' Party of Germany. In his dissection of this program, Marx is defending a revolutionary political project as opposed to an opportunist and reformist one, and in so doing is simultaneously combating revisionism while also clarifying essential elements of Marxist political theory. Among these essential elements that Marx clarifies and advances are the need for a dictatorship of the proletariat, a transition period between capitalism and communism which must emerge out of capitalism and not be understood as developing in a vacuum, the importance of proletarian internationalism and a rejection of nationalism in substance as opposed to form, and a scientific understanding of distribution as fundamentally inseparable from the underlying mode of production from which distribution takes place. 
While some of what Marx does here can, at first, seem like nitpicking, the depth and scope of his critique becomes clearer as one works through the arguments. With that general outline of what Marx is doing in this text firmly in mind, we can move into the details of the critique. So Marx begins by taking chunks of the Gotha program and then responding to and dismantling the content bit by bit. The first snippet from the Gotha program that Marx attacks is as follows, quote, Labor is the source of wealth in all culture, and since useful labor is possible only in society and through society, the proceeds of labor belong undiminished with equal right to all members of society, end quote. Now, at first glance, this may appear to be a fair statement that any socialist could utter without too much pushback. But remember that this is a political program intended to lay out the foundational principles and vision of an ostensibly revolutionary socialist organization. As such, it contains in its relatively simple language monumentally important nuances, assumptions, omissions, and ideas that must be fleshed out and examined more closely. Marx goes in on this sentence immediately, arguing that labor is not the source of all wealth, but that nature undergirds and gives rise to human labor power and provides the context for all productive activity, as well as acts as the primary source of all instruments and subjects of labor. By neglecting the fact that our shared natural environment is essential to the creation of all value, one helps provide cover for those who own natural land and resources and leverage that unjust ownership to exploit the worker. Many of us are familiar with the idea of the enclosure of the commons, right? This was fundamental to the rise of capitalist exploitation. Therefore, to leave nature out of this equation is to de facto accept, or at least obscure the truth of, private property which is the basis of capitalist exploitation and domination. Marx says, quote, In present-day society, the instruments of labor are the monopoly of the landowners as well as the capitalists. And in fact, the monopoly of property in land is the basis of the monopoly of capital and the existence of the capitalists, end quote. In other words, labor cannot be separated from nature, and the private ownership of land cannot be separated from the existence of the capitalist class. After dismantling some minor assumptions embedded in the ideas of useful labor and the existence of society, Marx hones in on the last part of the sentence, namely, quote, the proceeds of labor belongs undiminished with equal right to all members of society, end quote. This sentiment is expressed in slightly different language elsewhere in the Gotha program as a demand for, quote, a fair distribution of the proceeds of labor. Marx begins prodding at this idea by asking basic questions like, what are the proceeds of labor, the product of labor or its value, and what is meant by fair distribution? After all, do not the bourgeoisie argue that the distribution of resources under capitalism is already fair? And don't we know as socialists that legal frameworks for relations and distribution arise out of underlying economic relations to begin with? Moreover, by saying that the proceeds of labor belong undiminished with equal right to all members of society, that includes those who do not or cannot work, but then allowing such people those proceeds mean that those proceeds cannot be undiminished, for it would involve taking proceeds created by labor and giving it to those who did not engage in that labor. These questions may seem exhausting, but Marx is driving so hard at these seemingly benign proclamations in order to highlight three fundamental and extremely important truths. 1. That the idea of undiminished proceeds of labor does not and cannot make sense, because in a context where society as a whole owns the means of production, certain essential deductions must be taken out of the proceeds of labor to both cover the cost of doing business and to provide a robust social safety net for all of society. 2. There are lower and higher phases of communism, and in the lower phases, when humanity is still emerging out of and scarred by the old world order, the individual producer receives back from society after deductions exactly what they gave to it, and 3. The distribution of goods and resources cannot be separated from the underlying mode of production. So let's explore these three in depth. In the first example, the claim that in a communist society every worker must receive the undiminished proceeds of labor is absurd, according to Marx, because in a society where the instruments of labor are common property, the product of labor is a social product. 
As such, deductions from the proceeds of labor must be taken to cover the cost of doing business at all, which include covering the replacement of the means of production used up, the expansion of production, and reserve funds to help cover workplace accidents, natural disasters, etc. Moreover, and perhaps even more importantly, deductions to the total proceeds of labor in society need to be made to cover the costs of the administration of society not belonging to production, to cover the common satisfaction of social needs like housing, education, health care, etc., which grow in proportion to the development of socialism, and funds to cover those who are unable to work yet need to be taken care of by society. Here Marx says, quote, The undiminished proceeds of labor have already unnoticeably become converted into the diminished proceeds, although what the producer is deprived of in his capacity as a private individual worker benefits him directly or indirectly in his capacity as a member of the broader society. End quote. In other words, while some chunk of the direct proceeds that an individual worker creates through labor are taken for these other essential costs, the worker is paid back in the form of being a member of society whose needs are taken care of. Now let's compare this to a capitalist society. So in our society, a worker is definitely already stripped of the full proceeds of her labor, but that value is not put toward ensuring their needs are met. Rather, it's taken up and turned into profit or taxed by a government who acts in the interest of another class. Those deducted proceeds on the whole do not return to the worker in the form of social goods and services but are usurped by bosses, landlords, imperialists, etc. In a communist society, on the other hand, the deductions made go directly into the maintenance of that society, not for the enrichment of another class, but rather for the protection, enrichment, and nurturing of that worker, her family, her community, and her fellow human beings more broadly. Now let's move on to the second example. Marx lays out the argument well. And now I'm going to quote Marx extensively. Quote, what we have to deal with here is a communist society, not as it has developed on its own foundations, but on the contrary, just as it emerges from capitalist society, which is thus in every respect, economically, morally, and intellectually, still stamped with the birthmarks of the old society from whose womb it emerges. Accordingly, the individual producer receives back from society, after the deductions have been made, exactly what he gives to it. What he has given to it is his individual quantum of labor. For example, the social working day consists of the sum of the individual hours of work. The individual labor time of the individual producer is the part of the social working day contributed by him, his share in it. He receives a certificate, a labor voucher, from society that he has furnished such and such an amount of labor after deducting his labor from the common funds, and with this certificate he draws from the social stock of means of consumption as much as the same amount of labor costs. The same amount of labor which he has given to society in one form, in other words, he receives back in another. Here, obviously, the same principle prevails as that which regulates the exchange of commodities, as far as this is exchange of equal values. Content and form are changed because under the altered circumstances, no one can give anything except his labor, and because, on the other hand, nothing can pass to the ownership of individuals except individual means of consumption. But, as far as the distribution of the latter among the individual producers is concerned, the same principle prevails as in the exchange of commodity equivalents. A given amount of labor in one form is exchanged for an equal amount of labor in another form. End quote. Now, that can sound sort of confusing, so let's dive into it a little bit. Marx basically says that the idea of equal right in this lower phase of communism, known to us as socialism, is still stigmatized by bourgeois limitation. Namely, that the amount one gets to consume with remains predicated on the amount of labor they supplied. In other words, at this lower transitionary phase of communism, there will remain some level of inequality. But instead of that inequality being premised on class distinctions and private property, it will be premised on an equal standard, how much labor one gives to society. You will get more, not based on who your parents are or how much land and capital you own, but rather on how much labor you contribute to society. Marx goes on to flesh this out in depth. Quote, but one man is superior to another physically or mentally and supplies more labor in the same time or can labor for a longer amount of time. 
and labor to serve as a measure must be defined by its duration and its intensity, otherwise it ceases to be a standard of measurement. This equal right is an unequal right for unequal labor. It recognizes no class distinctions because everyone is only a worker like everyone else, but it tacitly recognizes unequal individual endowment and thus productive capacity as a natural privilege. It is, therefore, a right of inequality in its content like every right. Right, by its very nature, can consist only in the application of an equal standard. But unequal individuals, and they would not be different individuals if they were not unequal, are measurable only by an equal standard insofar as they are brought under an equal point of view, are taken from one definite side only. For instance, in the present case, are regarded only as workers and nothing more is seen in them, everything else being ignored. Further, one worker is married, another is not. One has more children than another, and so on and so forth. Thus, with an equal performance of labor, and hence an equal in the social consumption fund, one will in fact receive more than another, one will be richer than another, and so on. To avoid all these defects, right, instead of being equal, would have to be unequal. He goes on. But these defects are inevitable in the first phase of communist society, as it is when it has just emerged after prolonged birth pangs from capitalist society. Rights can never be higher than the economic structure of society and its cultural development conditioned thereby. In a higher phase of communist society, what we would call communism, after the enslaving subordination of the individual to the division of labor, and therewith also the antithesis between mental and physical labor has vanished, after labor has become not only a means of life but life's prime want, after the productive forces have also increased with the all-around development of the individual, and all the springs of cooperative wealth flow more abundantly, only then can the narrow horizon of bourgeois right be crossed in its entirety and society inscribe on its banners from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. End quote. In summary, although a socialist society would provide and protect social welfare in the form of guarantees to housing, education, health care, employment, etc., like no capitalist society could or would, it would still be limited at first to the slogan, from each according to his ability, to each according to his contribution. And, in fact, this has always been true in every socialist revolution up to this point, since, by definition, we have only yet been able to experiment within the lowest phases of communism, i.e. socialism. By being honest about this reality, by acknowledging the fact that socialism must emerge out of the actual conditions of capitalism, and by understanding that we cannot change every aspect of the world overnight, we can come to a more mature, sober-minded, and realistic understanding of our project and where we stand in relation to what's unfolding. To reject these realities and to expect a move from capitalism to communism without a transition is to fall prey to the most naive forms of idealism and utopianism, which in turn, ironically, forecloses on the possibility of moving forward at all. Lastly, we reach the third example, that the distribution of goods and resources is a function of the underlying mode of production. This is important, and it'll, it'll become clear why this is important as I go on. But once again, I'm going to quote Marx. Marx says, quote, Any distribution whatsoever of the means of consumption is only a consequence of the distribution of the conditions of production themselves. The latter distribution, however, is a feature of the mode of production itself. The capitalist mode of production, for example, rests on the fact that the material conditions of production are in the hands of non-workers in the form of property and capital and land, while the masses are only owners of the personal condition of production, i.e. labor power. If the elements of production are so distributed, then the present-day distribution of the means of consumption results automatically. If the material conditions of production are the cooperative property of the workers themselves, then there likewise results a distribution of the means of consumption different from the present one. Vulgar socialism, and from it in turn a section of the Democrats, has taken over from the bourgeois economists the consideration and treatment of distribution as independent of the mode of production, and hence the presentation of socialism as turning principally on distribution. After the real relation has long been made clear, why retrogress again? End quote. Now, this argument takes very little explaining, as it is obvious to any of us who have been on the Marxist left what Marx is getting at here. 
For do we not have all types of left liberals and so-called socialists whose entire political project is to alter merely the distributions of goods and resources while rejecting the idea that any real transformation in the mode of production or the ownership of the means of production need to take place? Are there not an infinite amount of people who identify as leftists who argue in favor of, say, a UBI or universal health care or student loan debt elimination or the proliferation of co-ops, but who draw the line at the idea of putting an end to the private ownership of the means of production and who bristle at the very idea that perhaps some level of force or militancy will be needed to confront the capitalist class? How many Bernie supporters and DSAers, for example, want alterations in distribution but become skeptical, even antagonistic, at the idea of actually displacing and eliminating the capitalist class and thus socializing the means of production. In Marx's time, as well as our own, this is a hallmark of revisionism and opportunism. It can be either conscious or unconscious, but the result is the same. Thinking that socialism means changing the distribution of resources without eliminating private property or putting the means of production into the hands of the workers. Marx is showing us that this can never be sufficient, and that distribution will always be ultimately tied to the dominant mode of production. Therefore, in order to move into socialism proper, a revolutionary confrontation with the owning class and their private property is essential, and any attempt to reduce socialism into a merely reformist movement centered around redistribution can only ever be liberalism and opportunism. These three sets of arguments form the bulk of the chapter, But Marx has one more important point to make before moving on, and it centers around the implicit conception of nationalism inherent in the Gotha program. The snippet he extracts from the program to criticize is as follows, quote, The working class strives for its emancipation first of all within the framework of the present-day national states, conscious that the necessary result of its efforts, which are common to the workers of all civilized countries, will be the international brotherhood of peoples, end quote. Marx says that this sentiment regarding nationalism stands in opposition to both the Communist Manifesto as well as to all earlier forms of socialism because it fundamentally confuses content and form, confusing the necessity of fighting first at home with the sufficiency of fighting at home. He argues, quote, It is altogether self-evident that, to be able to fight at all, the working class must organize itself at home as a class and that its own country is the immediate arena of its struggle, insofar as its class struggle is national, not in content, rather, as the Communist Manifesto says, in form. But the framework of the present-day national state, for instance, the German Empire, is itself, in its turn, economically within the framework of the world market and politically within the framework of the system of nation-states. Every businessman knows that German trade is at the same time foreign trade, and the greatness of Er Bismarck consists, to be sure, precisely in his pursuing a kind of international policy. End quote. So this view for Marx is much too narrow, and it reduces proletarian internationalism to a mere consciousness that the result of its efforts will be the international brotherhood of all people, which is a phrase ironically taken from a bourgeois organization, Marx points out. It does nothing to lay out the actual international functions of the German working class, instead substituting for it simple awareness and a vague gesture toward a future international brotherhood. Marx says that this weak internationalism stands below that of the bourgeois internationalism of capitalism centered on free trade, noting how capitalists also assert that the result of their efforts will be the international brotherhood of all people. This capitalist internationalism is imperialist towards the global south, free tradist towards its European peers, and cosmopolitan culturally. Marx says at least this form of bourgeois internationalism actually does something, whereas the internationalism of LaSalle and the program reduce it to a mere idea. He argues that the International Working Men's Association was at least an attempt to create a central organ for proletarian internationalist activity despite its flaws. In fact, Otto von Bismarck's proxies, after reading the Gotha program, declared to the satisfaction of Bismarck that the German Workers' Party had sworn off internationalism in its new program. A damning indictment, to be sure. Allison? All right, so 
uh, we've covered the first and the second sections of the Critique of the Gotha program, and so now we need to wrestle a little bit with the final two. So in the third section of the text, Marx addresses uh, this statement from the program. Quote, the German Workers' Party, in order to pave the way to the solution of the social question, demands the establishment of producers' cooperative societies, with state aid under democratic control of the toiling people. The producers' cooperative societies are to be called into being for industry and agriculture on such a scale that the socialist organization of total labor will arise from them. End quote. So let's try to figure out what's going on here. So here Marx really dials in his criticism to a very strategic standpoint about, you know, where this program is failing to understand the need for a revolutionary break from capitalism and has fallen instead into a sort of non-antagonistic view of the state. So Marx writes that, quote, instead of arising from the revolutionary process of transformation of society, the socialist organization of total labor arises from the state aid that the state gives to the producers' cooperative societies, and which the state State, not the workers, calls into being. It is worthy of LaSalle's imagination that with state loans one can build a new society just as well as a new railway." End quote. So for Marx, this reveals LaSalle's own incoherent and incorrect view of the state. LaSalle sees the state not as a form of bourgeois control, but rather as a somewhat independent reality that could be manipulated by socialists for their gain. And because of this, the Gotha program ends up calling for state funding for cooperatives, and then argues that these state-funded cooperatives can in some way lead to the abolition of capitalist social relations, and the replacement of those social relations with a socialist organization of society. And this should be of concern to us, right? Here it is not really the organized proletariat who's getting rid of capitalism and establishing a proletarian dictatorship. It's some impartial independent state who will fund the process by which bourgeois control, presumably not through that state, will be undone. And we can start to see some of the tensions here between Marx's notion of the state and LaSalle's notion. So Marx notes that the demand claims that this state aid will be the placed under the control of toiling people, but points out that this language is largely superfluous, given that at the time, the toiling people in Germany were mostly not even proletarians, but rather peasants. And so Marx notes sort of a imprecise use of language that frustrates him here, and that calls attention to some of the flawed Lasallian ideas that have snuck into the program. And Marx also points out that if the toiling people are to make demands to the state to act as an intermediary for the development of socialist institutions, there's an inherent concession that it's the state itself which rules, not the toiling people who've had to petition it. And so in this sense, there's no real way to build power for the masses so long as the bourgeois state remains a mediary through which, you know, they have to rely on to exercise power at all. And so what sounds on a surface level like a socialist cooperative idea is in fact an idea about state development leading to socialism and pushing out the need for revolution. So, Marx, of course, it's very important to note, does not totally reject the need for some sort of cooperative system wherein the workers exert control. He writes that, quote, the workers desired to establish the conditions for cooperative production on a social scale. And first of all, on a national scale, in their own country, only means that they are working to revolutionize the present conditions of production, and it has nothing in common with the foundation of cooperative societies with state aid, end quote. So the problem then for Marx is that under the Lasallian paradigm expressed in the program, this control is established, sanctioned by, and achieved through invoking a state that is no friend of the people whatsoever. Now, this is a very core divergence in these two theories that needs to be dealt with. So Marx concludes the section by asserting, quote, But as far as the present cooperative societies are concerned, they are of value only insofar as they are the independent creation of the workers, and not protégés either of the government or of the bourgeoisie. So Marx does say there might be room for developing these kind of cooperatives, for really building this sort of movement, but it can't be funded by the state, it can't be funded by the capitalist class, it has to be an independent creation of the workers as a movement. And so here we really see Marx developing quite a level of frustration with LaSalle's view of the state and the way that it's influencing the party to try to see the state as this neutral and independent thing. So in the final fourth section of the text, Marx addresses what he calls the democratic section and critiques the program's language regarding, quote, the free basis of the state, end quote, and the German worker party demand for a so-called free state. And again, Marx will really get into some more depth about what the state is, what it means here, and we're going to start to see some language about the proletarian dictatorship occurring here, which is very interesting from, you know, the later Marx. 
So here Marx provides an even more in-depth criticism of the Lasallian view of the state. He writes that, quote, it is by no means the aim of the workers who have got rid of the narrow mentality of humble subjects to set the state free. In the German Empire, the state is almost as free as in Russia. Freedom consists in converting the state from an organ superimposed upon society into one completely subordinated to it. And today, too, the forms of state are more free or less free to the extent that they restrict the freedom of the state. So, end quote there. And the problem here for Marx is that the idea of setting the state free doesn't make sense from a socialist demand. There's a certain sense, actually, in which the state has already been set free as a process initiated by bourgeois revolutions, which have supplanted the feudal state as an imposed reality upon society via the control of monarchy. The bourgeois revolutions themselves in many parts of Europe already set the state free in as much as they've made the state subordinate to society more broadly, specifically to the class interests of the bourgeoisie. And so here, Marx argues that the Lasallians reveal a deep misunderstanding of how the state functions and its relation to class because, quote, by treating existing society as the basis of the existing state, it treats the state rather as an independent entity that possesses its own intellectual, ethical, and libertarian basis. But again, the state for Marx is not an independent entity. It is an expression of class rule. It is an expression of class contradictions and cannot be understood outside of those things. For Marx, the state can't be understood as an independent structure totally free of class influence, but rather as an expression of it. He states that, quote, the different states of the different civilized countries, in spite of their motley diversity of forms, all have this in common. They are based on modern bourgeois society, only one more or less capitalistically developed, end quote. And so the state has to be understood as an expression of capitalism and as an expression of bourgeois rule. So, having noted uh, sort of the incorrect view of the state found in the program, Marx concedes that the present bourgeois state can be contrasted sort of with a future state which can emerge at the point that capitalism has begun to fade away. And he thus poses the question, quote, what transformation will the state undergo in communist society, end quote. And here Marx explains that there must be a stage between capitalism and communism, and that the state during this period must be, quote, the revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat. End quote. And here we hear that famous language that has become such a source of debate for people interpreting Marx. And Marx notes that the program does not consider the stage of development or the state features which would develop under communism. Instead, it simply reiterates demands for democratic rights, which are in no way more revolutionary than the demands of the most bourgeois Republicans. And this is sort of frustrating, right? Marx does point out the failure of this program to really take into account what the state under communism would look like. But for us as contemporary readers, it can also be frustrating that Marx himself doesn't explain that in detail here, instead continuing to focus on a critical angle of attacking the program for its many errors. And this has created controversies within Marxism that go on today. What these words about the proletarian dictatorship mean are super up in the air. Lenin would argue with many others about them, and even some anarchists who try to trace themselves to a Marxist lineage today still struggle to interpret these in a certain way, and Marx doesn't give us a lot of clarity here. He simply continues his attack on the program. So, as he continues, Marx argues that because the party wants to work within the presently existing German state, Many of the demands that it makes are essentially meaningless and pointless, because the German state at the time was an empire without democratic representation or even a liberal legal system. He argues that these demands might make more sense for the expansion of an already existing democratic republic, but not for the German context in which the party is operating. And he notes that, you know, it is wise of them not to demand a democratic republic because they're not large enough or strong enough to build it, but it calls into question why these demands are there, what purpose they're serving, and what the party thinks it's accomplishing with them. And Marx seems to have a very negative view of this. So Marx concludes the main body of the text by focusing on a list of demands made of the state in the program. He first looks to the demand for universal and equal elementary education by the state, universal compulsory school attendance, free instruction. And Marx really goes in on this one. He demeans this initial demand for sort of multiple basic errors. He questions whether or not any sort of equal education can possibly exist so long as class society creates a fundamental inequality at the level of property division. And it seems that Marx suspects that this program underlies a general liberal view towards this and views, you know, equality as something that can be secured through the state, despite a broader social structure that makes equality impossible at the level even of production. 
Marx also points out that compulsory education has already been achieved in Germany and elsewhere, and that it's not really a strictly speaking socialist demand whatsoever. And here again, we see Marx's frustration with this text, as he really has to wrestle with why it is that they're making demands that just factually do not make sense in the German context. Finally, he really declares that education by the state is also not a useful or progressive demand for socialists to make, and they ought not make it, because it makes no sense to demand that the state ought to educate the people. If the state is an expression of class rule, then why is it the state's job to educate the people, and what goal could that have? And in a somewhat funny turn of language, he says that it's the job of the people, in fact, to give the state a rather stern education of its own. And here Marx is not throwing out the possibility of having, you know, a bourgeois state provide regulation of public education for the populace. That is something that he says has been achieved in many places, but it's different than the demand that the state educate the people directly. And that demand itself reveals again the Lasallian error that fails to understand precisely what the state is, how it operates as an organ of class power, and how it cannot simply be used to build socialism from scratch within capitalism. So all these errors are based on a false view of the state that sees it as an independent entity capable of being used for socialist purposes. And so here Marx concludes the final substantive section of the text by condemning this Lasallian view of the state. He writes, but the whole program, for all its democratic clang, is tainted through and through by the Lasallian sect's servile belief in the state, or what is no better by democratic belief in miracles, or rather it is a compromise between these two kinds of beliefs in miracles, both equally remote from socialism, end quote. All right, so now we're going to go into the second part of our episode that we always do, where we ask some questions and have some answers for each other and try to unpack this text with a little bit of dialogue. So this first question I think is really interesting and is something that it would be easy to miss in this text, uh, which is sort of what are the seeds of eco-Marxism in this text? Yeah, definitely. It, it's sort of funny because uh, Marx opens with this point about nature, but you know he then moves on pretty quickly and you're right, it can sort of get lost and so it kind of stuck out to me. I was like, you know, this is maybe something that doesn't often get talked about with this text, so maybe I could bring a little light to it. So yeah, Marx opens up his critique of the Gotha program with a firm insistence that labor in and of itself is not the source of all wealth, but rather that nature proceeds and allows for all labor to exist in the first place. Nature is the ultimate source of, of everything. It's the context in which all productive activity takes place. And while ignoring or not mentioning that in a political program might seem like a relatively minor thing, uh, it's really not. I think what Marx accomplishes by emphasizing it so much in the beginning of this text, and indeed by starting off this entire work by focusing on it, is to put our relationship to nature as individuals, as communist thinkers, and even as members of the working class at the center of our political imagination as well as our political project. Uh, broadly, I think this is a core strength of dialectics. It does not leave anything out, right? It refuses to see the natural world through the lens of bourgeois empiricism or capitalist externality. Rather, it insists on a dialectical relationship between our species and our activity and the natural environment from which we organically arise. Capitalism, on the other hand, sees the natural world in terms of static, innate, and unconnected sort of raw material, which only become important or useful by processing them into commodities. Liberal philosophy, going back to thinkers like John Locke, Thomas Hobbes, Rene Descartes, etc., interpret the natural world as something outside of ourselves, something to be acted upon, but something fundamentally separate from us. And then you also have Protestantism, which is a sort of cultural pillar of American life and, and society. And, you know, Protestantism views the natural world in terms of man's dominion over nature. In that account, we did not arise organically from the earth. We didn't bubble up out of the cosmos, right? But we were put here by God to either dominate the natural world or, you know, in the best case scenario, be good stewards of it. But still, it remains something distinct from us. What dialectics does and what Marxism does is reject this illusion of separateness. It insists on placing the human subject back into its proper context and thus understands our productive capacities through our interdependence on the entire web of life from which we can never be uncoupled. Whereas the bourgeois mind sees, for example, a discrete body of water, a discrete beaver dam, and an individual beaver, 
the dialectical mind sees an interconnected ecosystem. There is no beaver without the water. There is no dam without the beaver. These things, you know, cannot be fundamentally separated. And in the same way, there is no human capacity to reproduce the material basis of our existence without the underlying natural environment in which we are so thoroughly embedded. So you can see the seeds of eco-socialism being planted by Marx a full century before the rise of the environmentalist movement, mind you, through both his critique of the capitalist relationship to nature as well as his insistence on centering the natural world in the communist vision of the future. And while past socialist experiments might have downplayed or outright ignored this undercurrent of Marxist thought, us contemporary communists really don't have that luxury or that choice. Our political and economic project is inexorably bound up with an intense awareness of environmental sustainability. And to take it even further, I would argue that there cannot be socialism without this deep respect for the natural world and a dedication to living in harmonious, consciously dialectical balance with it. And there cannot be a sustainable relationship to the natural world without a radical restructuring of our political and economic systems, as well as our philosophical and cultural assumptions and worldviews. So in this way, what might seem like a relatively minor point at first glance grows exponentially into a core feature of Marx's thought. Marx himself may not even have been fully aware of what he was actually doing, but standing as we are in the midst of a mass extinction event and a climate crisis, we can take those seeds, nurture them, give them water, put them in the sun, and let them blossom. Allison? <laughs> Yeah, I really love that. I, I think there's a few thoughts that I have on this. Um, one is that I think that, yeah, it's really interesting to see how these same ideas crop up in other places throughout Marxist theory, right? So part of, I think, what you got at that's good is this is built into dialectics. If we think back to Engels and Socialism, Utopian, or Scientific, the whole second section of that text is this critique of sort of an atomistic metaphysics that states that there are only individuals and that individuals are the fundamental units of reality. And Engels instead suggests that individual beings and things are always caught up in processes that are at play. And we see that really emphasized here in terms of what Marx is talking about. And I think also we can connect it a little bit to even Mao's on contradiction, where Mao talks about how changes in the natural world have to do with both internal and external factors acting on each other. And we can't understand processes developing without understanding interrelationships of things. So I think it's interesting to see how built into dialectics on the whole this insight is that you're here kind of moving in this ego marx direction that I think is really cool. And I definitely think it's something that, you know, some people have done work on this. John Bellamy Foster comes to mind as sort of an eco-Marxist, but Marxists have often also uh, sort of neglected to think about some of the implications about nature that are in Marx's work. And I think that's why I think this question is really interesting to try to explicitly thematize those things. The other thing that I think is kind of interesting here is that there's a tendency among some theorists, including some theorists I like, to kind of argue that the later Marx had gotten rid of the influences of Hegel. And this seems like one instance where that's clearly untrue, um, especially this is one of Marx's latest texts that we have access to. And also, this is an insight that comes straight from Hegel's phenomenology regarding how human subjectivity only sort of emerges through the objectification of nature and how there's an inherent reliance and dependency on the natural world built into human subjectivity. So I also think it's interesting to see that even in this later Marx, you know, you often we hear it talked about as the more scientific Marx, these Hegelian philosophical understandings are still really central to a lot of his critique of the politics that he's looking at. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. So let's go ahead and move on to the next question. And my question for you, Allison, is, you know, Marx says that communism emerges, quote, still stamped with the birthmarks of the old society from whose womb it emerges, end quote. In the revolutions that we have seen since Marx's writing, how have we seen that basically play out? In what ways were the socialist states of the 20th century, for example, stamped with the birthmarks of the old society? Yeah, so I think this is an important passage because you hear it get used in a lot of ways, right? So sometimes it is used as a defense of some of the messiness of socialist revolutions, and I think fairly, and other times it's often used to excuse very obvious political errors in previous socialist politics. And I think we have to wrestle a little bit with the distinction between utopian and scientific socialism in order to really understand what Marx is saying here. So here, Marx is dealing with the fact that socialism, at least in its scientific conception, 
isn't just a clean break from capitalism or starting over society from scratch, but it's rather built out of capitalism. So we can think back to Engels here a little bit, uh, and there's some clarification. So capitalism, according to Engels, in a sense, makes socialism possible. It creates socialized and disciplined labor and the modernization of industry such that it would be possible to build a socialist society at all. And the problem then within capitalism is that it also contradictorily maintains individual ownership and appropriation, which stands in contradiction to socialized labor. And so this is part of why there's an inherent instability to capitalism. So socialism is thus not about just sort of burning everything down and starting over again, like some sort of more naive views of revolution might look about it. It's about unleashing the power of socialized labor, which was built by capitalism, via proletarian revolution and dictatorship, right? So what Marx is getting at here in this idea that the birthmarks of the old society are there is that if what we are doing is liberating the socialized labor that capitalism has created and then trying to build a new society, there's not going to be an instant transition into communism that occurs there. And so this means that socialism, even after the immediate revolutionary moment, uh, will continue to have imprints of capitalism that have to be exceeded and worked around. And we have to wrestle with which parts of capitalism are useful, which parts were truly socialized, and which parts are reactionary. Uh, one thing that socialists in the 20th century had to wrestle with was sort of whether or not scientific approaches to labor discipline, so Taylorist or Fordist ideas of disciplined socialized labor, uh, which developed in capitalist states, were useful or even compatible with the socialist project. And these kind of questions, you know, were imposed by those birthmarks of capitalism that still existed in the socialist transitionary period. I think if we look at the projects of the USSR and the PRC as well, we can see that both face these questions in their struggles around modernization and development of infrastructure that capitalism uh, sort of required because their own revolutionary struggles took place in semi-industrial or semi-feudal contexts. So the socialist states here had to wrestle with how to develop some aspects aspects of capitalism, even under socialism, in order to make their projects successful. In the context of the USSR, the new economic policy obviously stands out as a very fraught example, and in the context of the PRC, the great leap forward as this attempt to create sort of industrialization and modernization also stands out as a very difficult and fraught history here. And these instances, I think, perhaps point to very intense ways that socialist revolutionaries and revolutionary movements had to wrestle with these birthmarks of capitalism capitalism that were still there, with the need to not just break from capitalism, but to tease out the useful aspects that it had created in terms of modernization, and then retool those towards socialized ends. And this is a project that is very difficult. Uh, and aside from sort of just the modernizing and infrastructural questions, there's also ideologically the way that we carry over capitalist ideas. We can think in the context of the PRC, for example, the way that Mao insists that after a revolution, ideological struggle between capitalist ideas and non-capitalist ideas continues and actually intensifies in many ways. And we could look towards the Cultural Revolution as an example of that sort of breaking out into an antagonistic contradiction because those birthmarks are imposed even on the thoughts of socialists after the revolutionary moment. So those are just kind of some of my thoughts of how we saw that concretely play out in the last century's revolutionary movements. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a very important thing to, to sort of sober-mindedly acknowledge and accept that, you know, capitalism is our unchosen, imperfect, but necessary starting point. And, you know, if you really take that and embrace that and internalize that, um, it will do a lot in hedging against some of your utopian or idealist impulses um, rooted in sort of an impatience, a want and a sincere and often laudable desire to really just overthrow every aspect of this rotten world. I, I relate to that deeply. But we see a difference in the advancements made by movements who take seriously this idea that we're emerging from an old order and there is this transition versus, you know, movements really centered in a utopian or idealist conception of revolution and what the future you know, holds for us. And so you can see that th there's an efficaciousness to those movements that are sort of sober minded in this way compared to those movements who, you know, are not in various ways. And I totally agree also ideologically and culturally, you know, you mentioned the cultural revolution and the necessity of that. And just think, like, if you're an American or even a Canadian or whatever, and you're living in this society, you know, even if we had this this huge movement that could take over the means of production or institute a Marxist party, a dictatorship of the proletariat, etc., imagine the layers and layers of cultural 
indoctrination and centuries of capitalist ideology just imprinted into every little nuance of our thinking and our worldview. Um, you know, that will be so fucking hard to overcome. And that's why, of course, there's that necessity from the Maoist point of view and even a lot of Leninist points of view for a cultural revolution alongside a political and economic one. And I think we can't ever lose sight of that. And then the last thing I want to say is Marx used the word and, and, you, and you were right to point out this is late Marx. So, you know, I, we were talking before we recorded how. This being very late Marx, like sick Marx, almost going to die Marx, it, it lends credence to what he's saying here because this is a full lifetime of thought and reflection and, and sort of editing of his previous thoughts, etc. So what he's coming out with in this text is really some of his last thoughts on the matter um, after a lifetime of dealing with this stuff. So I think it adds some credibility to those thoughts. And he uses the word birth pangs, right? Like you, we're emerging from the womb of the old world into the new and there are these birth pangs. And I really think about that in relation to the imperfections of, let's say, China or the Soviet Union or even of Cuba or other Marxist movements that, you know, weren't able immediately to do everything right. And of course, there's some segment of the the left, the anti-communist left or whatever, that wants to immediately point at those failures and then discard everything. But what Marx is saying is that these birth pangs are unavoidable. You're not going to emerge, you know, completely formed out of the womb of capitalism. It's going to be a messy, difficult, but ultimately unavoidable process. And looking back in proletarian history, not um, in a way that says, did they succeed or did they fail, but rather in a way of how did they advance the struggle? How did they um, experiment and deal with some of these initial problems coming out of the womb of the old order? And how can we learn from and build on that, um, you know, and, and also have a respect for the fact that given their imperfections and flaws and, and ultimately even failures, these were still really dedicated people who had no precedent, especially if you're talking like R Lenin and the Bolsheviks, R Russian Revolution, even the Chinese and the Cuban Revolution, of course, little to no precedent. Um, and they had to do it all by themselves, often with all forces of capitalism and imperialism around the world levied against them. And so just sort of understanding how fucking difficult and almost impossible of a task that is and how prolonged this fight to build socialism will be, I think gives me simultaneously a lot of respect for those past movements and hedges against this utopian or idealist impulse to just discard them because they weren't exactly perfect or didn't align ideally with my ideas about how revolution should be, you know. Right, exactly. And I think, like, the important part of that takeaway that you're getting at, too, is this, like, question that we should always be able to ask ourselves, regardless of the extent of failure, is what did they contribute to our understanding of struggle, right? How is it that we learn something from this, regardless of that? And that, I think, is what's really crucial in the scientific socialist approach that Marx is getting at here, is we're going to fail. Those birthmarks and those birth pangs are going to create failures, but they can be learned from in some way, and they can be moved in an actionable direction. And that's what I find rather hopeful, especially about the scientific socialist approach is that we don't just have to throw those things out. We can study them and there's something to be gained from them. Yeah, agreed. So uh, the next question then is, uh, what does Marxist critique of the type of nationalism advocated in the Gotham program tell us about the Marxist understanding of proletarian internationalism? And what elements of the American left today replicate the error that Marx critiqued? So what, you know, the overall view you can pull out of, of Marx's critique here is that Proletarian internationalism is essential to the communist movement. It's essential to the working class movement, the movement to build socialism locally and globally, right? Uh, he admits that, that class struggle starts in a bourgeois nation state. It's sort of the arena that class struggle can sort of begin in, right? If, if we have um, class struggle here in the U.S., it will obviously begin uh, facing off with our own bourgeoisie, our own reactionaries here at home, right? But that it must be quickly linked up materially to other class struggles across the globe. National liberation efforts obviously came after Marx passed away, but those national liberation efforts needed to keep this in mind as well. And Fanon's argument with his humanism in Wretched of the Earth is also gesturing in this direction. Like these national liberation efforts are essential. And yes, focusing around nationalism to buck off the shackles of colonialism is a necessary stage in the sort of confrontation with capitalism broadly and colonialism. 
but if it doesn't sort of get beyond its national limitations, if it if it just gets mired in nationalism, um, it can severely limit what that movement can accomplish and what it can do. And in fact, you know, the decolonization and national liberation struggles of the 60s and 70s all around the world were almost always internationalist in practice. You can think of the Black Panther Party going to China, the IRA constantly linking their struggle up with the Palestinian struggle, the international black liberation movements and organizations, whether political or even artistic, that were created during this time to link up um, you know, these, these black liberation struggles specifically, and even examples like the Navajo sending material support to Ireland during their potato famine caused by English imperialism to a lot, to an extensive degree, are all examples of actually materially putting internationalism into practice and not merely paying lip service to it. Because to confine one socialist project to its national borders and merely sort of pay rhetorical lip service to internationalism as, you know, the, the party that, that Marx is critiquing did, is a failure of proletarian internationalism. It's really a, a stepping back from the responsibility of internationalism. And any communist movement or organization, Marx reminds us, has to take meaningful, actionable steps. Like he talks about actually doing, right? Not just talking, not just like gesturing towards, but actually meaningfully and materially taking steps toward real international activity in the here and now. Uh, he reminds us that capitalism is already international in scope. Um, and so in, our, in order for us to fight it, our movements must be international as well. The bourgeois nation state, though, and I think this is important and sometimes isn't always taken as seriously as it might need to be on the Leninist left, right? But the idea that the bourgeois nation state is totally an obstacle to our emancipation. It's not a vehicle for its accomplishment. We can think about Marx talking about not laying you know, hands on the ready-made machinery of the state. We can talk about Lenin talking about fundamentally transforming the state uh, in the process of taking it over. Um, and so uh, I think there's a reminder of that here as well. And while taking over a state and establishing a dictatorship of the proletariat through that state is often essential strategically, especially in a world dominated by nation states, which Marx does make clear in this text, we must at the same time, as I said, begin to fundamentally transform the state through our revolutionary activity. And Marx makes this clear, Lenin takes it up, expands it, deepens it, and Mao takes it even further, but they all understood this basic fact. Um, in the text, Marx says he even talks about the International Working Men's Association, right? And he says this was created to act as a concrete organ for organizing and coordinating internationalist activity. Despite its flaws and its ultimate failure, it was still an attempt to not just vaguely gesture towards the need for internationalism, but to take concrete steps to try to coordinate that internationalist activity. And it's this insistence on actually doing something, as opposed to having a vague vision of internationalism or reducing it to a rhetorical device that Marx drives home in this text. And it's also worth noting that in order to be effective internationally, we do need higher forms of organization here at home than we currently have, right? We need mechanisms of international material support that can only come from better and more structured organizing. In the U.S., we we don't really have a, a party or organizations that have the capacity to lend material support to, say, the Palestinian struggle or the Venezuelan struggle or, you know, enter struggle here. And uh, that, I think, is an indictment of our own inability in the imperial court to get organized at the levels we need to get organized at to begin pursuing pursuing this, this real material proletarian internationalism. And then about leftists today, you know, people on the left who sort of fall into the air that Marx is critiquing here. You know, there's any leftist today who like downplays imperialism, merely pays it lip service, doesn't take this seriously the international dimensions of both capital and the struggle against it, and who even opportunistically attack proletarian movements and leaders abroad, particularly when those movements and leaders are under imperialist attack cough, Jacobin and Libcom cough, act as hindrances and obstacles to proletarian internationalism, and therefore they must be combated. So in the same way that we want to expand our ability to materially support internationalist proletarian and decolonial movements, the other side of that is also combating in our own midst those segments of the so-called left who want to opportunistically undermine that proletarian internationalism by having their philosophical critiques of this or that leader and this or that movement as if you know, they're not completely impotent themselves and have no fucking right to wag their finger at other movements who are actually doing the shit that they only fucking talk about. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. I just wanted to point that out. <laughs> uh, so overall, you know, overall, Marx is reminding us that 
Proletarian internationalism is not merely one tool in a big toolkit, but rather it's a fundamental pillar of any successful proletarian movement and struggle, and we would be wise to continually keep that in mind. Yeah, no, I think all that's very good. And I think, especially on that last point in terms of the attitudes adopted, I think a lot about Lenin's own admonition that, you know, attack your own bourgeoisie. <laughs> you know, they're, exactly. they're for you to fight. And, you know, Lenin even says, like, to attack the bourgeoisie of another country when you don't yourself understand the conditions there is, in Lenin's words, to play into imperialist intrigue, right? Mm-hmm. You're just sort of engaging in that, regardless of what your intentions are. And I definitely think that I like what you're getting at is that in terms of nationalism versus internationalism, it's not an either or, right? Go figure. It's a fucking dialectic. <laughs> exactly. Which is what we kind of keep coming back to. And I think it's interesting that on the left in the United States, I, I really do think we see errors on both sides. There is kind of a form of crude internationalism that denies national liberation or decolonization struggles as inherently chauvinist, but there also is often sort of a crude nationalism that can become popular as well that needs to be combated. Uh, in the context of the United States, we can think about the moments when the Communist Party USA turned towards a more nationalist approach, appealing to sort of American ideology and American founding values, or we can even think about sort of nationalist movements that end up rejecting Marxism as being, you know, somehow inextricably bound to Euro modernity or something like that. And both of these, I think, are errors that miss sort of the important thing, which is that nationalism and internationalism have to be complementary. And historically, like you said, on a global scale, they were. You know, it's sort of one of the funny things when I see either nationalists or internationalists reject the other side on the basis of Marxism, because I think when you look at, like you said, those movements in the 60s and 70s of national liberation, they were clearly interested in both both nationalism and internationalism, and we're clearly using Marxism to understand a national context. And it really is about sort of finding both sides of that coin because one reinforces the other in a useful way, and we want to avoid errors on both sides. Yeah, well said. And the last thing I would say on that, and sort of just I thought of it at the very end of what you were mm-hmm. saying, is this idea of and a lot of a lot of people on the left sort of get stuck in this idea where you know they, they do study theory maybe they don't read or they they just engage with theory through like memes or online sort of subcultures or whatever and you know that can take you so far but I really think that the sort of person who just sort of uh, sort of uh, thinks about these things in a vacuum or just have these ideas or just have these a priori commitments or dedications one way you can hedge against that in yourself or help other people work through that is to to mingle your understanding and your study of theory with a real study of, of history, right? How this theory was actually put into practice and played out. And a lot of those chauvinist errors are, or errors on both sides of that particular equation uh, can sort of be diluted or decreased or eliminated altogether by not only an engagement with theory, but an engagement with the actual history of these movements, how they played out. And once you start doing that, a lot of these arguments about like, you know, nationalism and stuff, they, they, they just they just become very crystal clear about how these things are all interconnected. It sort of forces a dialectic understanding because it's one thing to theorize in an abstract sort of way. It's quite another way to put those theories into practice and to learn from movements that came before us that put those theories into actual historical practice. And so combining historical study with theoretical study, I think is absolutely essential to have a well-rounded understanding of both. All right, last question, right, before we move on to the uh, final section. Okay, so this text is fascinating, among other reasons, for dealing with a question that we all still wrestle with today, left unity. Um, It's sort of become a meme in a lot of ways, but what can we learn from this text about unity between different left-wing groups and ideologies? Yeah, so this is one thing that I think is interesting about this text. In Marx, you know, you don't always find a lot of, like, very concrete analyses of the problems that you'll face organizing, right? You get incredible historical work, you get incredible philosophical and economic sort of analysis, but compared to, like, Lenin or Mao, who are giving you these tools for thinking through the problems that we encounter when we're trying to do organizational works. Marx rarely does that. But this text is exactly that, right? This is Marx intervening into a historical moment of organizing and potential unity between two groups. And kind of like, you know, you got at Brett, like, left unity is almost like a meme at this point, right? Like, people are constantly calling for it or criticizing it from different sides. And I think this text has interesting things to say about how unity functions and also how we approach unity in drafting sort of shared visions and statements through platforms or points of unity or things like that. 
So I think that in a sense in this text, Marx is warning us that when we try to work with other ideologies, the basic task of crafting demands becomes very difficult, uh, and language that might seem like a trivial compromise might actually reveal very strong divergent perspectives that can crop up in other ways. So one thing that we see in this text is that as Marx is addressing some of the language early on, he says like, oh, this idea of the state, I'm not going to talk about it now because it's very minor in this sentence, ends up ruining the second half of your platform. So there's there's these ways that often when we try to work with people who have radically different ideologies, we ignore struggle and paper over it for the sake of unity. And Marx is doing an interesting way of looking at a historical document where we see that begin to linguistically slip into the wording itself. So the perspective of this text, though, I don't believe is that unity is impossible, per se, so much as the idea that unity can't be achieved on the basis of compromising your politics. So the problem for Marx isn't just that the Lasallians are involved in the politics of the party, but that they're being invited to assert control over the public-facing politics of the formation in some way or another. So Marx notes that in the historical circumstances that this program was drafted in, the communists had a political advantage over the Lasallians in terms of power, and it's that the Lasallians who were coming to the party for unity because it was them who needed to grow and gain the aid of a larger organization. And so Marx, in his criticism, basically says that the party ought to have actually used their political advantage in this situation to prevent the Lasallian camp from sort of uh, introducing their own politics. And those who are involved in organizing obviously are going to be familiar with the degree to which unity and coalition in practice are formed out of political need, right? Online, when we talk about left unity, it's often this very bright-eyed utopian idea of what if we all just got together and fought off capitalism regardless of our differences. But when you're actually involved in organizing, whether that's worker organizing, whether that's tenant organizing, whether that's mutual aid organizing, you usually recognize that unity comes from groups needing each other and needing each other's help. And there are concrete and practical aspects of it that need to be wrestled with. And coalitions really come from that. And I think in this context, Marx does something interesting. And I think he kind of advises the party that they should have played a little bit more real politic to prevent the corruption of their politics from opportunists who needed their help. Help. Marx points out that unifying can be something that people get excited for. The idea of left unity, it appeals to a sort of triumphantalist spirit of overcoming, but it's also not without its dangers. You know, Marx says that, quote, one knows that the mere act of unification is satisfying to the workers, but it's a mistake to believe that this momentary success is not bought too dearly, end quote. And so unity has to be for a purpose, is what I see coming from Marx in this text. And where diverging ideologies are at play, communists have to maintain leadership and political power and require that other ideologies have to agree with the actions at hand and come under communist politics in order to create these sort of coalitions. And this is historically possible, right? This is the entire idea of the united front, especially as articulated by Maoism, wherein communists control political and ideological guidance for these broader movements towards specific ends. And unity, then, is not a strategy or an end goal in and of itself, but it has to have a purpose. It has to be a tactic employed towards something. And I think here Marx really demystifies unity as just some ideal that is worth struggling for inherently and reminds us to always weigh the costs of unity and always weigh sort of the politics at play behind unity so we can guard against opportunism. And this is difficult to do in practice because, again, sometimes you have to work with groups that have radically different ideologies than you in order to win demands that you're working for in your organizing in order to achieve basic operational goals. But what Marx is telling us to keep in mind is that unity is not an inherently good thing and that it can be a very dangerous thing. And we have to make political calculations about the costs and benefits when we pursue it. And I think that that is a very practical and sort of grounded view of organizing here in Marx that stands out among his work in a really positive way. Yeah, I mean, great point. And, you know, I just kind of want to address an aspect of this, which is, you know, maybe if you know, listening to all that and stuff, you know, you might come away thinking that either Marx is being nitpicky or that Marx or there's like he's just being a classic Marxist where he's just shitting on other people because he wants to shit on them. But I think what you really have to remember historically is that this is Germany, right? This is Marx's home territory. Marx cared a lot about getting this shit right. And this critique comes not from some, you know, narcissistic want to just be right and nitpicky and, and pick apart something because somebody else is doing it, but because he really, at the bottom of his heart, dedicated his whole life to this shit and it was happening in his, you know, sort of home country and he wanted it to succeed. He, uh, you know, he cared about the future of this movement. And in fact, 
Um, that's why he is so nitpicky because he cares so much and he has to lay these out and show how this, you know, assumption leads to this error and all this stuff because he wants this shit to, to succeed. And at the very end of this text, after his uh, little appendix where he just makes some minor points before ending, he actually signs off with, uh, um, I have spoken and saved my soul, right? It's the last thing he said. And that is basically gesturing to the idea of like, he's sick, right? His doctors were telling him not to put even this much work into anything. He was on sort of his last leg. He's entering the very end of his life. And he knew that. Um, and he and he was going to die. And, and he saw this movement happening and he wanted it to get right. And so at this very end, I think it's really telling that he ends it with, I have spoken and saved my soul. Um, for a bunch of different reasons, it shows that he really does care. And he's doing this not to be a dick, but to help shape the movement. And even, you know, a century and a half later, communists like us are still learning from this text, still picking this up and running with it and trying to use it to shape our own movements. And that's a beautiful, powerful thing. And so, yeah, just thinking of Mark sort of um, approaching his own uh, death and, you know, being riddled with sickness and boils all over his body, sitting down and painfully getting through uh, this critique because he cared so much about it, I think is really essential um, to understand that the context from which this critique comes. Right. And I think that, like, the tone of this text is interesting, right? Because it is Marx at his most scathing at certain yeah. points. <laughs> like, he is incredibly, you know, I, I always note that Marx is very sarcastic in his writing, and you see that really play out in how he dismisses some of this. But oftentimes, when he's not sort of at that scathing, the tone is almost disappointment, right? Yeah. He sort of notes over and over again, like, you took this thing that is in the statement of the First International, and you modified it in this way, and you were trying to improve it, and it's just really frustrating that you didn't see the political content that you were changing. And and it is sort of like, I think you're correct, not like, oh, I just hate everything that you've done here. It's a frustration that like you're trying to do this and you're messing some things up in a way that you're not seeing. And I really need to intervene to try to prevent that, you know, and ultimately it ends up being unsuccessful. The program has some minor revisions, but it's largely adopted. And, you know, the history of that party that comes from it, the SWP, is a whole thing that can be studied. But at least Marx tried, you know, and I think that it's interesting to see here again. And uh, thinking about a connection to Mao, right, Mao in Combat Liberalism points out that we can't avoid criticism for the sake of personal relationships, that criticism is, you know, always going to be important because political struggle is important. And at the end of his life, Marx is writing here to organizers who he has worked very closely with, who he knows and has had personal relationships with. And I think a lot of us in a situation where we're on our way out would be tempted not to try to point out these contradictions, but to, you know, end things on a much more warmer note with people. But Marx's commitment to the movement is so thorough that even though this could be a final correspondence in some ways, he's willing to set aside how that could personally hurt his position with these people and really emphasize the need to fix these political problems. And there's something very inspiring about that, I think. Totally. And when he sent it, or Engels sent it, I can't remember who did it. It was in the very beginning of this text. It was like, um, very friendly and cordial to note they like the sort of the cover letter they, they sent with it and they're like hey can you please pass this on to the other comrades and shit <laughs> so I think that's funny and then also angles as you said uh, Marx can obviously get very scathing and uh, harsh and I think even in the editing process angles toned down some of the uh, sharper edges of Marx's rhetoric but you know from Marx and angles through to Lenin and to Mao and and through to us today Leninist and Maoists today there is this sort of um, this uh, this need this obligation to to criticize and to clarify and um, you know to work through these nuances and point out errors and that can often be associated with you know sort of us being like assholes and dicks and you know just like trying to shit on people or being sectarian and stuff but I think it really does and, and its best manifestations at the very least <laughs> comes from a genuine desire to move forward and to, to build a better world and to actually make progress and not see progress that has already been made discarded and errors that have already been made replicated. And so from Marx to Lenin to Mao, you see in their own context, their own historical epoch, they're, they're carrying on these very same struggles for the betterment of the movement overall, not um, for their own egoic or sectarian reasons. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's a good note to end that on. All right. With that said, let's move on to section three, application points. Okay, so for my application point, I want to drive home the idea that socialism is and must be a transition toward communism. 
Marx talks about this as lower and higher phases of communism, and by so doing, he reminds us of the ironclad connection between socialism and communism. And this is important, particularly because we see in our own time, as our comrades in the past saw in theirs, a revisionist attempt to separate socialism from communism and thereby undermine both. How many times have you heard someone on the left say something akin to, I am a socialist, but I'm not a communist? I've heard it my entire life. In fact, as a younger, less developed socialist, I too indulged in this idealist fantasy that socialism was somehow not only distinct from communism, but the end goal of my political project. This is as delusional as it is incoherent. Socialism literally can only ever be the real transition toward communism. It is the journey, not the destination. The reason this is important to understand is because separating socialism from communism reduces socialism in practice to some form of liberalism. And just as Marx highlights and attacks in this text, it often takes the form of focusing on redistribution under the capitalist mode of production instead of focusing on transcending that mode of production upon which distribution is premised and shaped. This strategy of separating socialism from communism takes on many forms. Market socialism, co-op socialism, trade unionism, social democracy, etc. And none of them in their own have ever been able to actually challenge capitalism or imperialism because they are so easily co-opted back into the capitalist mode of production and thus back into left liberal reformism. Many people who make this move don't necessarily do it out of conscious opportunism or out of a hidden desire to retain capitalism. They often think their path is a genuine path toward transcending capitalism, naive as that may be. It's often just a matter of confusion, naivete, or underdevelopment. As such, we need not always take an overly antagonistic approach to such people. Often a friendly engagement and comradely struggle can help reduce confusion on this topic and push a sincere socialist toward a more scientific and comprehensive understanding of what socialism is in relation to capitalism and communism. Having said that, there are of course certainly bad faith actors and conscious opportunists who take these lines as well, but I genuinely think they are a minority based on my experience. In any case, understanding socialism as the real movement toward communism, which emerges out of the old order and drives toward a better future, helps retain not only an experimental and non-dogmatic approach to building socialism, but it also helps retain a revolutionary and militant posture and approach as opposed to a gradualist and reformist one because it insists on the ultimate need for a revolutionary confrontation with and rupture from the capitalist mode of production and the concept of private property which underpins it. It can never be satisfied with mere redistribution of goods and services while leaving the material basis of the capitalist world order intact. By understanding socialism as the lower phase of communism and simultaneously combating the revisionism and opportunism of the Social Democratic Workers' Party of Germany, Marx reminds us of what socialism really is and shows us the absurdity and ineffectiveness of trying to chop off and disconnect the lower phase of communism from its higher phase. Allison? Awesome. So when trying to think about application here, I was actually very interested in the third section of this text, where Marx kind of makes a critique of the cooperative ideal being put forward by LaSalle. So Marx makes a critique of what I see as sort of like a parastate reformism, when he attacks the idea that socialism will emerge from the establishment of workers' cooperatives. The Gotha program had, as we've said, followed LaSalle in suggesting that capitalism could be done away with, uh, not through revolution, but through the development of sort of competing infrastructure of cooperatives operatives funded by the capitalist state, which would somehow eventually do away with it. And this controversy that occurs in this text can help us understand debates about reformism today and help us understand how reformist ideas can mask themselves as something more substantial, even when they're not necessarily. So I think that one thing is that we often think of reformism only in terms of advocating for certain legal or legislative reforms. And so in this sense, reformism is largely understood as an electoral or a parliamentary struggle for certain laws that might reform capitalism in some way or another. And often our criticisms of reformism focus very heavily or even exclusively on such struggles. But what's interesting in Marx's critique of LaSalle is that it gets at a different sort of reformism that must be combated. In calling for the establishment of cooperatives, the Gotha program was not simply demanding government reforms, although they did demand government funding, but also arguing that institutions of workers 
religious control and democracy could be established under the present state of capitalism. And this idea is not, of course, totally ridiculous. Under capitalism, it is possible to create institutions which allow for some expression of worker control. The problem, however, is that the program saw these institutions as a means of escaping capitalism via a non-revolutionary route. The point of building these institutions for the party was so that, quote, the socialist organization of the total labor will arise from them, end quote. And in this sense, the program represents another type of reformism and gradualism altogether. The goal is still to reform capitalist society and gradually transition to socialism. While this is not undertaken through state legislation or the retooling of the bourgeois state proper, the idea that independent worker cooperatives can constitute the basis for socialist development without a revolutionary struggle against the bourgeois state is still a reformism that Marx is rather critical of here. So this problem of non-legislative or what I would call like parastate reformism uh, still plagues the left today. In a theoretical context, we could think of theorists like Richard Wolff, who have some interesting economic insights, but still assert the need for workers' cooperative movement as a means of supplanting capitalist modes of production. While workers' cooperatives may make workers' lives better, more sustainable, and somewhat less exploitative, it's important that we as Marxists insist that they do not in and of themselves threaten capitalism in any way. They are still integrated into the capitalist market, they still leave individual ownership intact in all other workplaces, and they do not in any way threaten capitalist power as it's exercised through the state or other social institutions. In this sense, the function of such institutions is no different than electoral reforms that win workers' rights but do not threaten capitalism more broadly. Even outside of more theoretical work like Wolf's, there's often been a turn towards similar errors, often under terms such as dual power or base building. And now before I get too edgy and piss people off, I will acknowledge that these terms have a multiplicity of meanings and that the most problematic iterations of them do not represent all those who organize under these terms. I myself spent quite a bit of time advocating for both base building and dual power, and my focus here is on clarifying what is useful in these concepts while rejecting what is fundamentally reformist by using Marxist discussion as a jumping off point. So oftentimes those who propose dual power use it to refer to building a comp competing infrastructure of socialist institutions in line with the sort of cooperative focus put forth in the Gotha program. I myself slipped into this error in a lot of my writing from two years ago, and a certain segment of the groups that employ these theories think that capitalism can be outcompeted by a more rationally organized parallel system of cooperatives, tenants unions, and mutual aid networks operating under a form of workers' democracy. And such a conception of dual power is incorrect in as much as it's incomplete. If it is not capable of theorizing such a network as part of a broader revolutionary struggle, then it slips into reformism. There may be good reasons to support mutual aid networks, tenants, unions, and cooperatives, and in fact I remain a proponent of all these forms of organizing, but we have to understand the purpose of these programs. These programs cannot be ends in and of themselves, they must be part of a broader movement that seeks to go on the offense against capitalism. The problem with the Gotha program's conception of cooperatives is that it sees them as slowly phasing away the capitalist system and is not needing to confront bourgeois state power. We must avoid similar errors in our own work and analysis on strategy. The core concept of modern dual power strategies that seek to build institutions to serve workers under socialist control is salvageable and it has a place within organizing, but it cannot be understood as the core strategy that we will use to fight against capitalism. This dual power approach rather ought to be understood to represent a sort of tactic and a broader strategy against capitalism. If it is allowed to become the sole form of organizing that we engage in, then, like the Lasallians, we find ourselves merely reforming capitalism and reducing enmity between the workers and the bourgeois state. And this is, from my perspective, a key insight to be gained from this text. Marx has not rejected the idea of cooperatives. He rejects the idea that cooperatives can be a replacement for revolutionary struggle itself, and he argues that they need to be independent and conceptualized as part of a broader movement of the workers against capitalism. And so I think this is one way that we can look at modern debate debates around dual power and its meaning, and we can help clarify what a useful understanding of dual power is versus a reformist understanding of dual power that needs to be done away with. So that brings us to the end of this episode. We hope that this has been enjoyable for you and that you have uh, found it helpful in some ways. If you haven't read this text yet, you absolutely should. It is not very long. It is like under 25 pages and you can get through it relatively easily. And hopefully you can find some meaning for it that'll be useful in your own study in addition to what we've talked about here. As we said before, if you want to support this and you want us to be able to continue to do this into the future, you can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Red Menace. 
And for all of our patrons, we are super thankful for all that you do in terms of supporting us, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, where everyone is sort of in a precarious situation. It's been really incredible to see continued support and you help make it possible for us to continue to put this out during a time of crisis like this. It means a lot to us. As a reminder, we are now shifting from talking about a theoretical text on every episode to alternating between one episode about theory and one episode about uh, sort of current events. So you'll get this episode for this month, and next month you will get an episode about current events. There's plenty to talk about right now. Um, moving forward, though, we're going to go ahead and for our next text, cover the Communist Manifesto. So in two months from now, when we get around to doing that, that's what we're going to be looking at. So if you want to go ahead and start reading up now, it's always good to get some time so that you can read alongside us and be informed about the discussion that we're having and make sure that, you know, you think we're reading the text correctly. Thank you so much for tuning in. It really means a lot to us. Solidarity.